Well, brethren, the title of my offertory today is Godly Jealousy. Now, the story of Cain and Abel gets a lot of use in offertories, but it offers some very strong points uh, that I think that are worth looking at. Well, in Genesis, we see that both Cain and Abel brought an offering before God. This is something that they knew they had to do. It was something, obviously, they were raised with. They knew what was expected and how to accomplish a good offering. But we find in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3, Genesis 4 and verse 3, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. You know, Cain's offering was from the ground. This wasn't necessarily a bad thing. But he could have offered better, whether it was his attitude or whether it was maybe not the best of the produce that he had to offer God. God didn't accept it. If you look at the Hebrew words, it actually shows that God somehow showed favor and respect towards Abel's offering, but towards Cain's offering, he didn't even bother to look at it. It offended him. It, it wasn't good. And so this upset Cain, as we know. But this wasn't just some superficial anger. It was one that was rooted deep down in him. It didn't just spring up one day and he was angry. And it had been festering there for a while, something constantly bothering him. And God saw this in Cain, and he warned him. Let's read in verses 6 and 7. And so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You know, Cain's offering, while it didn't please God, didn't stop him from conversing with Cain. Cain could have made a choice here, and on his next offering, done better. He could have changed his attitude. But God could see the outcome of what was going to happen if Cain continued with this attitude of anger. And so he warned Cain that sin was there waiting to get in. The choice was Cain's, and he could rule over it. You know, God's point to Cain was that he could be led to do the right thing, or he could be pushed by sin and Satan and do the wrong thing. Sin it says, is waiting at the door. It's wanting to come in to take over. James 4 and verse 17 says, And to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. But I also want to look at verses 13 to 16 because it gives more context to this verse. So if you will, James 4 and verse 13 James 4.13, come now you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. You know, this type of attitude of deciding what we want to do when we want to do it, 
It's not right. You know, oftentimes what we want to do, it might not actually be right. Or what God wants or expects from us. Instead, we know we are to be seeking God's will for every aspect of our lives. You know, how close have we been to God since the last chance that we had to give an offering? How will God look upon our offering today? And we often talk about having the right attitude, the right mindset. But how has that impacted us since the days of unleavened bread, which was the last time we had the chance to give an offering? If you will, since we're in the book of James, jump up to verse 4. Uh, verse 5, rather, James 4 and verse 5 says, Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? That's God's spirit. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do you feel that God's spirit is yearning jealously within you, within me? Now, jealousy is an interesting word. Psychologytoday.com says that jealousy strikes both men and women and is most typically aroused when a person perceives a threat to a valued friend relationship from a third party. The threat may be real or perceived. It is not limited to romantic relationships, but can also arise among siblings competing for parental attention or in friendships. Jealousy is distinguished from envy in that jealousy always involves a third party, an outside force. Envy occurs when two people, and is best summed up as, I want what you have. But jealousy is a signal, a wake-up call, that a valued re relationship is in danger, and steps need to be taken to regain the affection of one's mate or friend. And I felt that that was a very good uh, way to explain jealousy. So in relation to ship to this scripture here in James, God is actively jealous for our attention and our relationship with him. He wants and he desires it. He is jealous for us in the sense that he wants our full attention. But uh, it's a two-way street. We have to do our part to actively take a role in wanting to also act jealously with our heart and give it to God, to have that relationship with him. James also says that we have to make sure that we keep ourselves unspotted from this world in pure and undefiled religion. And if we are able to do this, then we also have to learn to be humble and willing to submit so that we can obtain the grace that James also mentions. Now, in our booklet, God's Law or God's Grace, in the conclusion, we state this. We have shown you in this booklet that true Christians who are under God's grace must strive to keep his law. Grace does not do away with God's spiritual law. Rather, God's grace helps us to keep the law. At the same time, Christ must live in his disciples, empowering them to be obedient. But they must be willing participants in the process of becoming righteous and inheriting eternal life in the kingdom and family of God. Thinking back to Cain, he made a choice. And it was just that, a choice. He could have chosen to change his attitude, his behavior, his mightier than thou attitude, and he could have become humble. And on his next offering, as I mentioned, given a better one. 
And in so doing, God would have looked upon him and his new offering with the same attitude that he looked at Abel's offering. You know, it's all relative to the intents of the heart, which only God can see plainly. If you will, let's turn to Proverbs 3, and we'll begin in verse 1. Proverbs is full of instruction and wisdom for us. Proverbs 3 and beginning in uh, verse 1 says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you and bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. There will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns may be filled with with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastenings of the Lord, nor detest his corrections. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. These instructions that are given here are core to who we should be. Obedience to the commandments. Merciful. Understanding the truth having godly understanding, acknowledging God in all our ways, having humility, tithing, and by extension, giving offerings, and accepting trials. You know, it's on all these things that we build and grow. Now, the ability to bring an offering to God is really much more than just throwing some money in an envelope, calling it a day. No, it goes deeper than that. And we've just looked at how we are to live day to day here in Proverbs. It's about the relationship that we have with God and how we guard that relationship. As I mentioned, God wants to give us the help that we need. He wants us exclusively for himself. If you will turn with me to Exodus 34 and verse 10. Mr. Harris was talking a little bit about this this morning. Exodus 34 and beginning in verse 10 says, And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvelous I will do marvels, not marvelous. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I have commanded you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. You shall make worship, for you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice." No, God is, was willing to mightily intervene for the Israelites. But it was in return for their complete and their utter willingness to turn to him. If we want mighty things done in our lives, we must observe what God commands us to do. Matthew 24 and verse 24 states that 
we should know that we cannot serve two masters. Either we serve God or we serve ourselves along with sin and Satan. But if we can conquer this with God's help, we will become sons and daughters. Let's look at Romans 8 and verse 12. Romans 8 and verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For, if you, did, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Now, brethren, there's no denying the power and the help that God has put on the line for us. But it takes each of us willingly trying to reach out and have a relationship with God so that we can make it.